Well, I watched them. But we watched them. We watched them covet our style, our, our confidence, our natural rhythm, our terms of endearment, but not our struggle. And it's the products of the ghetto, right? What poverty can produce. And oddly enough, we giggled when you mimicked us. Sweet revenge. Like, homies not stupid can tell the difference between admiration and mockery, please. So we protected our music because truthfully, we thought it was all we had. And watch y'all make a killing off it. Hip hop to jazz, like Elvis to Fats Domino and Patrick to Gwen Stefani. And the fact them names are foreign, that's just what I'm pointing to, see? Y'all imitated Jamaicans, and you attempted to grow dreads. And you commodified reggae. That's Marley's face on everything. And your children, they used his faith as an excuse to smoke weed. So we grew angry, unaware of God's plan for rescue. But we ain't know better. We had a flawed version of personhood, identifying only by being victims of oppression. It's a true story. Y'all got to see it. We... We coveted y'all's camaraderie, your sense of family, your food and work ethic, but not your struggle. See, we were jealous. We were jealous you had a homeland and a native tongue and your parents spoke it and we were just the offspring of the broken, hopeless. So we all learned Swahili as if we knew we were from that region. Silly, I know, but what you supposed to do when all you know, your closest cultural customs are similar to your captors, huh, pastor? It's easier to blame them economic woes, right, on fill filtering through our borders, right? Them immigrant job hoarders. Like, we should all just deport them all on one bus and stupid us broad brushed. We thought y'all were all Mexican. It's dumb, I know. Forgive us, it's embarrassing. We were jealous, and we were angry, and we ain't no better. We were selfish, envy, prideful. We were Willie lynching, fighting over the same piece of mud pie. Like, como se dice? Lo siento mucho, por favor. See, we all need grace much more. It's a true story. Gotta see it. We, we coveted your privilege, your generational wealth, your unquestioned personhood, but not your struggle. See, we felt it wasn't fair. We wanted your options. Your grasp on proper doctrine and literature, it's silly, huh? See, that American dream, apple pie, it worked for you. So we worked for you. You made it seem so easy, grit your teeth, you could succeed too. But we didn't know your story, shoot. We thought white was white, not Irish or Celtic or the Bolshevik plight or, or the pain of Baron Stains inherited. You said you weren't there, it wasn't fair. You wouldn't dare, but we ain't care. Like, you ain't know better. You told us you struggled too. Rednecks in trailer parks, like, like me and you are cool, I hurt like you. But that was fire for the fuel that boiled into them riots. And y'all were so confused, and truthfully so were we. But now we understand. We suffer the same stain we gained from a shared ancestor. See, we all descend from Adam's sin, and it riddles every inch of us. But now we see clearly, see our timelines, our past, our crimson cord. It's one rope, and it's made from many strands. But now it's all... But now it clearly stands, dyed the colored red from our savior's blood shed. And a rope finds its strength from the multiple lines wrapped around each other until they all perfectly intertwined. So maybe we could call it even and walk through life knowing that a three chord bond is not easily broken. That a three chord bond <laughs> is not easily broken. From your wife. <laughs> hey, propaganda. She got a PhD. Hey, man, give propaganda a big hand. Amen. Amen. Uh, some of y'all might have thought, if you knew that that was Pastor Miles when he first came out. Was, <laughs> man, he grew those dreads quick. <laughs> Uh, uh, propaganda, his, actually, if you're wondering where he learned his Spanish, his wife is uh, Latina, a PhD and uh, something, but it don't matter. She's got a PhD, I don't care. <laughs> but she's a sweet lady. But uh, um, let's give him one more big hand. God bless y'all. God bless y'all. Amen. Uh, my name is Miles, the pastor of The Rock. Welcome to uh, The Rock, East County, North County, San Isidro, all our microsites. Uh, let's give all those people out there a warm welcome. A happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. 
And we do um, want to say happy Father's Day. Can we have all the fathers stand up and we can just give them a big hand? Amen. Amen. God bless you, Father. Happy Father's Day. Amen. 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 Um, every year at Father's Day in our planning meetings, we go, what do we do for the dads? So we can never figure it out. So we have donuts for you outside. <laughs> it's easy, guy. Just give me a donut. I'm good. I'm good. So uh, uh, hopefully it doesn't deport, the sugar doesn't kill you. Um, let me encourage all of you, as, as many of you can do this, is uh, 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 contact your dad. Now, I know some of you don't have good relations with your dad, haven't talked to your dad in years. Uh, some of your dad had, have done some horrible things, and so I don't want to put you in a awkward position, but if you can, uh, reach out to your dad. And some of you, uh, I don't have a dad. My dad passed away two years ago. So be happy and grateful that you have a dad. Uh, ultimately, we have a, the, the perfect father in heaven, and we, let's be thankful for that. But let me encourage you to reach out to your dad, tell him something. Happy Father's Day, if that's all you could say. Text him, Happy Father's Day. Try not to take that burden to your grave. Uh, what's, what the devil is so good at destroying relationships and destroying people's lives, and, and we carry pain and anger uh, thinking we're hurting the other person. You know, I'm going to be mad, and actually it's killing you. It's like taking poison, hoping it kills the other person. Um, so uh, trust me, I don't know your situation, and I know there's some horrible situations out there, but the least you can do is get rid of it on your heart and ask God to re release that burden from your heart. Father's Day is a great day for a lot of people. It's a hard day for others. So my prayer is that God would encourage you. Amen? Amen. 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 So let's see our Bibles today. Let's see our Bibles. One, three, say word. One, two, three, say word. Amen. Let's turn to John chapter 13. John 13. John 13. Um, today is June 21st, 2015. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, June 17th, Wednesday, 9 p.m., a young um, white male walked into Emmanuel AME Church, all black church in South Carolina. And after sitting in a Bible study for an hour, a prayer meeting for an hour, shot and killed nine African-American Christians. And his intent was to start a race war in this country. Um, he understands the racial tension that already exists. And so today I want to pray for uh, that church, those people, our brothers and sisters, Pray for our country, pray for our church, and that not only would a race war not start, but a love revolution would start. Um, I want to talk about racism today, and I know that that is a topic people get all tight with. It's not a topic that's very popular. However, it is a real issue. It's one of those secret sins that people don't want to talk about, don't want to acknowledge. Um, and I know when I talk about something like this, there's a lot of risk because, especially in our church, it has, is the United Nations. If you look around, we got a whole bunch of people up in here. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand on that. When you come to church, you have thousands of people and then you have millions of issues because we all have multiple issues. And the the blessing we have is to have a very diverse church, which is uh, not my opinion. It is a fact very rare in the world. Church time, 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning on Sunday is the most segregated hour of the week in this country. Blacks go to church together. Whites go to church together. Latinos go to church together in general. And that's not a general statement. It's a, it's a generalization that is over 90%. So we have, this is not normal. This is very, very abnormal. And so we need to take advantage of that. 
But when I talk about race, I have to talk about it understanding there are going to be people saying, well, I hope he says what I wanted to say for my people. <laughs> and I hope he says what, I'm, what I want to say about my people. <laughs> and he better represent. Da, 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 da. So uh, I want to I wanna, uh, just th- expose that elephant in the room that I'm going to do my best to represent God. And... Um, <laughs> If you feel like I'm siding on one side of the issue, just, just pray. Just pray for you, pray for me, pray for us, because that's not my intent. Um, but I do want to uh, pray before we usually pray at the beginning of our services, pray for this church. Uh, Pastor, Pastor uh, Pinkney right here, we'll, we'll get to him. He's the senior pastor. He was killed in his church at a prayer meeting. And I'm going to read the nine people total, eight and additional people who were killed with him. And as I said, this young man's intent was to create a race war. I, I, my prayer is that it's going to backfire on the devil with the devil meant for evil. God's going to turn into something good. And that is going to be a love revolution. I'm going to read these lists of names, and I want to tell you these people I'm going to lead, read are your brothers and sisters. They may not look like you, but that's irrelevant. It's what's in their heart. They're your brothers and sisters. And they're your brothers and sisters more so than some of your biological relatives. Because some of your biological relatives will not be with you in heaven. Unless all your family saved, which is a rare thing. But if so, then I'm wrong. But uh, these people will be in heaven with you. Cynthia Hurd, 54 years old, worked in a library. Susie Jackson, 87 years old. Member of the church. Ethel Lance, cousin of Susie, 70 years old, was retired. Reverend DePayne Middleton, doctor, 49 years old, mother of four daughters. Reverend Clementa Pinckney, 41 year old senior pastor and state senator in South Carolina. Tawanza Sanders, 26 year old Allen University graduate jumped in front of a relative when the shooting started to shield the relative and he was killed. Reverend Daniel Simmons Jr. died at 74 years old. He was the only victim who didn't die in the scene. He was taken to the hospital. Reverend Sharonda Singleton, mother of three, high school track coach of Goose Creek High School, 45 years old. Uh, Daniel Simmons was 74 years old. Reverend Daniel Simmons was 74 years old. And Myra Thompson, 59 years old. Um, was killed. I want to read to you what their family members said to the guy who killed them. Because they got to two days after the shooting, he was standing in the room, the guy who killed them, and via video, they came to a courtroom and were able to address him through video. And I want to read to you what some of them said. I want you to imagine you are two year, two days removed from your family member being killed because of the color of their skin, because of hate. A relative of Myra Thompson said, give your life to Christ to this guy. Give your life to Christ. The mother of Tawanza Sanders, her son, 26 years old, was killed. She said, we welcome you to our Bible study with open arms. You have killed the most beautiful people I've ever known. Every fiber in my body hurts. I will never be the same. My son, Tawanza, was my son and my hero. But as we always say in Bible study, we enjoy you and may God have mercy on you. The granddaughter, Daniel Simmons. Although my grandfather and the other Americans died at the hands of hate, this, them being there, is proof everyone's plea for your soul is proof that they lived in love and their legacies live in love. So hate won't win. We have to decide that hate will not ever win. Can I get an amen? amen? The sister of, the, of uh, Reverend DePay Middleton, doctor, said, thank you on behalf of the family for allowing hate to not win. I'm a work in progress. I, I acknowledge that I am very angry, but one thing Dr. DePayne has always joined in our family with is that he taught us that our family was built on, our family is a family love built. We have no room for hate. 
so we forgive. It doesn't mean they don't want him to go to jail. It doesn't mean they don't want him to get the, penalty, the, the highest penalty that the, the law of the land will give. But they're not going to carry hate in their heart. This was a hate crime. It was a racially motivated crime. We all know that. And I want to pray for their family. And then today I want to talk about race in our country and racism in our country. So right now, if you will, bow with me and pray in prayer so we can pray for them. Lord, we thank you so much that you love us. We thank you so much for that family and those, that church family right now back east that either just completed their service or they're having another service. Lord, Holy Spirit, we pray you fill that place and comfort those families. We thank you that you honor those Christians who died at the hands of hate. Thank you that you honor them and their families and you will comfort those families. And Lord, I pray for them first. That the peace that surpasses all understanding would guard their hearts, their minds, their families, the services, the nine funerals that have to take place. Lord, I pray for the Rock Church that we would be a church of unity and love. And that we would not act like it doesn't exist. We would not act like there are not issues in our hearts. But that we would allow you to search our hearts. See if there's any wicked way in us as we sit here today in unity. Physically in unity. May we be spiritually united. And we pray for our country. Lord, we've had racism in this country since day one. And this thing, this stuff still happens. Lord, I pray for the day it's gone. I pray for the day we stand in unity. I pray for the day we can love each other based on the content of our character and the God design you have given all of us and not the color of our skin. May we look at each other and respect each other for who and what you made us and not what our hate has created us to be. Thank you, God, for being a God of unconditional, self-sacrificial love. May we display that one to another. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I want to share with you the background from which I speak. My, I have a grandmother who is white, and she was um, one of those uh, pale whiteness that could got, not get a tan, white. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> she was grandma. We called her Obi-Wan Kenobi because <laughs> my grandmother, we were having a snowball fight, and she had a coat on with a point at the top. It was a brown coat. She had the, the Obi-Wan um, hood. And we were having a snowball fight, and we said, let's hit grandma. And she couldn't walk real fast. She was like, y'all better not hit me. And we tried so hard to hit her with snowballs, and the snowballs were doing this. They were going around her. <laughs> so we said she had the force with her. <laughs> so literally for the rest of her life, like 30 years, for the next 30 years, we called her Obi-Wan uh, because um, her family disowned her when she married my very dark grandfather. Her family lived 10 minutes away. We never, ever met any of her family. Not one. So the only family she had was a bunch of brown people. <laughs> but she was grandma. My other grandmother was half black and half Chinese. Both my grandfathers were black. I lived in an all-black neighborhood. My first eight years of high school, uh, uh, elementary, first to eighth grade, was in a town that was all white. Three-quarters of a mile away was the dividing road. All the blacks lived on one side of that road, all the whites lived on the other side of the road. If you were black, you could not live in that neighborhood. They'd burn a cross on your lawn. That happened when I was a kid. We had whites in our neighborhood, and it was cool. But you couldn't live in that neighborhood. And because I have a very smooth, cocoa brown, <laughs> caramel color, that some of y'all go in the tandem booth and spray to get on. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I'm just saying. When I went into that neighborhood, 
I was the black kid. And I was reminded of that for those eight years. Whether literally or just it was there. There were kids in that neighborhood who I went to school with whose parents would not let them come to my neighborhood. But I went there every day, five days a week to go to school, to this Catholic school. I was reminded every time I went in that neighborhood and every time I crossed that street, I was reminded you were in a place where you are not welcome as you might feel in your own neighborhood. When I came back into my neighborhood because I was light, I was discriminated against because I was light. <laughs> Brothers know exactly what I'm talking about. So I got it over there and I got it over here. My high school was on that street. And so the high school, we all came together. When I got to high school, it was a whole different experience. We had a 60-40, it was 60-40 black. So we had a little the upper hand. It was none of that mess in our high school because the brothers ran the place and it was a little different. But in our high school, we got along. So I speak from that experience. I speak from exp experiencing it, my family, from my, as far back as my can remember when I, my grandfather, who grew up in Jamaica, West Indies, was on his deathbed. I went to share the gospel with him. And the first thing he said to me, he was laying on his back and he died several days later. He looked at me and said, as a matter of fact, he looked away from me. He said, you want to talk to me about God, go ahead. And he looked away. And he asked me why did the, he went to Catholic school, and this is not an in, in, uh, indictment against Catholics. It just happens to be where he went to church when he was a little kid. Why did the white priests, why were they racist against my black people in Jamaica? I've dealt with it all my life, and a lot of us in here know exactly what, you're what I'm talking about. And so I come from that and have an experience and carry that all my life to this day, to this day, dealing with racial comments to me, to this day. And so I, I speak from that, and I speak knowing that there are going to be some of you here saying, he didn't say this, he didn't say that, he didn't say this. Some of y'all don't like my title, All Lives Matter, because it should say Black Lives Matter. Well, I wrote All Lives Matter because that's what God told me to do, and that's just the end of it. I mean, the reason, the reason, it, says, the reason it says All Lives Matter because it's going to take all of us in here, it's going to take everybody to deal with this. This is not a black-white thing, it's a sin thing. Um, a few steps before I get to my plan. Number one, we need to acknowledge that racism does exist. If some people think, you know, I don't experience it. I don't know what they're talking about. Everyone make a big deal about it. All race, 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 race. Unfortunately, it exists more than you think. And we all have to, and I say we all, I mean we all have to step back and know that there's a bunch of millions of people not making something up. In this country, a black man is seven times more likely to be sentenced for the same crime as a white man. In this country, a black man will get a 20% longer sentence than a white man. In this country, when you are a felon, when you get out of prison after serving your time in half the states in this country, you cannot vote for the rest of your life. In the state of California, you can get your voting rights back a year after you get off parole. Many people don't bother. 10% of all African-American men in this country cannot vote. When you can't vote, you have no voice. What's the point? This is a reality in, in this country. There are a lot of things going on in this country that are systematic. And this is not for you to be mad at white people. This is not a white people thing. It's a sin thing. It's a sin thing. Not only do we have to acknowledge that racism exists, but we also have to acknowledge that it's spiritual. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, uh, verse 12. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but rules against authorities, against cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces in the heavenly places. The devil, since the beginning of time, has been trying to turn us against God and turn us against each other. And the minute he starts to get us to do this, oh, by the way, it's at the hands of people. There's no doubt that kid went in there to hurt other people. It looked different than him. But it's deeper than that. And in this room, a room this size, we have to acknowledge that people come in here with bias. This church, and this is a prayer of mine, this church is a place for you to come around people that look different than you and feel safe. And I know that's true. 
because I know people who have told me, I love coming to The Rock because it's so diverse. And, and, and some will, you know, say the, the little code words are saying it's the only place or the, the place for me to go where I can do that. Because you might not feel safe outside of this building around people who don't look like you. And that may be all your issue, by the way. That may be all in your head. Because people are not what you think all the time. And so my prayer is, as we talk about this today, is not to pit one another against each other, but to develop spiritual unity. I'm going to say unity. It's to build the kingdom of God. Because when you go to heaven, for all y'all who are going, it's going to look like this. And if you got a problem with, obviously you don't have a problem with this because you're here. <laughs> but, if you, if, but if people got a problem with that, they're going to get to heaven. God's going to say, you know what, uh, we, got, we got diversity up in here in heaven. You're going to be okay with that. We were not made in the, in the eyes of a racist, but made in the eyes of God. Uh, I want to read this verse to you. Uh, John chapter 13, verse 35. It says, By this you will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Let me say it one more time. By this you will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The most basic commandment, the greatest commandment is that we have love for one another. Not people who look like us. Not people who live in our neighborhood. Not people who make the money around the same pay grade that I have. Everybody. Even your enemies. That you would have love for your enemies. One of the most basic, matter of fact, the most important need of a child is to feel loved by their parent and how do they feel loved by their parent? Because you say, well, love me, love me, love this person. What does that mean? It means to make them feel like they matter. When you ever see those signs, all black lives matter, you know what that means? That we have a right to be loved just like you. We have a right to be acknowledged just like you. And when you say you love somebody, what you are doing is you are doing that which makes them feel like they matter. They, wor they are worthy. Your children, your neighbors. That's what that means. It doesn't mean you have some emotional, uh, sexual thing for them or you want to date them. It means, you know what, I'm going to do what I can to make you feel like I matter. Jesus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He says, you matter so much to me that I'm going to die for you. You matter so much to me. And guess what? All lives matter to God. And it's our responsibility as believers to lead the charge. I'm part of a group of uh, pastors that are part of a movement called the Reconciled Church, which is designed to break down racial divisions in churches and in our society. But it has to start inside the church. Ironically, most churches are segregated. So it's got to start there. Luckily, we, we don't have that problem. Matter of fact, look around the room. You might be new and you might notice walking in. People always say, man, I couldn't believe all the different people. This is heaven. You know, people come to, come to this rock and they, say, they come to this church all the time. They go, oh, they got all the lights and the, and the smoke and, the, and this loud. It's like a concert. No, no, no. It's like heaven. <laughs> Not for real. When you go to heaven, it's going to be loud. It's going to be shaking. It's going to be lightning Not, and fire and, and rainbows and crystal and diamonds blasting and people screaming. That's heaven. So that, that part of the service, that's like heaven. And the only other, the other part of the service that's like heaven is all y'all. One of the best things for me, one of the most enjoyable parts of me being a pastor of this church is when I get to stand outside and greet everybody and I have all these different kind of people come to me. Now, forgive me if I uh, uh, am stereotypical in my description because some stereotypes are true. What I mean by that, white people are generally lighter than dark people. Tall people are generally taller than short people. <laughs> Samoans are generally bigger than Filipinos. <laughs> I mean, there's just, some, there's just some stereotypes that are true. I was, I, when I was a youth pastor, I, was, I, was, I started my youth ministry with Filipino kids, and, and I had never met any Filipino kids. I literally didn't even know what they were. I had to go ask them, what are y'all? <laughs> and they said, oh, we Filipino, man. I said, okay, okay, cool. So stop th throwing beer bottles on my lawn because they were throwing beer bottles on my lawn. And uh, but I make a long story short, there was, this, there was this party with a bunch of Filipino kids, and, and I said, I'm going to go. It was a party with 300 kids at this ice rink in Mira Mesa, and I said, there's going to be a fight. So I went down, and I was going to stop the fight, and then I get there, and the, and the guy at the door said, you, you can watch the door for me. I said, why? He says, well, there's going to be a fight. I said, I know. He said, you know, some kids from Mira Mesa and Rancho Bernardo. He goes, no. 
It's, it's Samoans from L.A. <laughs> I was like, see how your reaction? There's a difference. <laughs> it's not a bad difference. It's just a difference. It's a difference designed by God that people look different. Three things. Number one in your notes. How can we love one another? This is on an individual basis. There are laws and, 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 and laws that are favored against people of color. That, that's a different issue, and it is an issue that needs to be dealt with. But we're going to talk about something you could do today. Number one, acknowledge our sameness. All of you in here bleed red. All of you here deserve love, need love. Need to be valued, need an opportunity to know who you are, why you are, and what God has created you for. Every single person needs that. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let, mass, let us make man in our image and our likeness. He didn't say let us make some men in our image. I was made in the same image of God just like everybody else. And everybody you see walking this earth was made in the image of God. No more, no less than you. Acknowledge that. Don't think you're better because you're not. And don't think someone's less than you because they're not. Because of how they look, where they live, how much they make, they're not. And you see someone walking down the street, eating out of the garbage. Broke my heart. I was downtown. This kid was 20-something years old, eating out of the garbage right on Broadway. That, breaks, that should break your heart. It breaks God's heart. That guy was made in the image of God just like I was. And yet we can look at people, look at different than us and say he or she is less than. That is from the pit of hell. It's wrong. Acknowledge our sameness. And number two, oh, by the way, we're all made. <laughs> the other thing is that everybody's, everybody's a, a, a shade of brown. You, you might not realize it that what you call white people, you're just really light brown. I know some of you who might be, uh, uh, you know, racist in that way. Some of you may feel like, you know, you thought you were white power. You're really not even white. Someone created that term. God said, I'm making people brown, just different shades. You know what happens when you lay out in the sun, you get a tan? Guess what color that tan is? It's brown. What's cool about God is that he can take one color and make different shades. If you haven't seen it, go to Puerto Rico. Any Puerto Ricans friends in here? You know what I'm saying. You go to Puerto Rico, you can see people who look really, really light and straight up Somalia black. <laughs> Speaking Spanish. <laughs> go figure. You go to New York City, there's just as many Puerto Ricans in New York City as there are in Puerto Rico. You got, uh, God says, God is an artist. Validate. Number two, validate my uniqueness. Psalm 139, 14, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God is an artist. I, I, I know that many of you mean well when you say you don't see color. But please don't say that. The only reason you say it is because you see it. White people don't say that to each other. Hey, I don't see color. Black people don't say it to each other. You only say it when someone different comes by. And then you say, oh, yeah, I have a black friend. Don't say that. <laughs> I know you mean well. No, for real, I really do. I know you mean well. But when you say you don't see color, here's what I can't speak for all people of color, but here's what I can speak for myself. Here's what I hear. Hey, you're a black guy. And I'm uncomfortable right now. And really clueless, so I'm just going to ignore the fact that you're a black guy and just say that you're white like me. Don't say it. They did a, they did a, they did a study with infants, and as early as nine months old, they were able to distinguish color. Because they put electrodes on their head and they showed them people of different races have... Uh, being emotional, and they wanted to see which people they resonated with 
and they would resonate to people who look like them, different than everybody else. I don't need to give you that science to know, to tell you that you see color. We're starting a church in uh, City Heights. There's 50, amen, amen. There's 51 languages in City Heights. I have no idea how many that, uh, that, that's known. I, there may be more, but there's a whole bunch of nationalities. Are you going to go down there and say you don't see all that? No, no. We see it. As I said, one of, the, one, of my, one of the best things for me is to stand out in front of the church and meet Asian people, Samoan people, black people, white people, Latinos, and all the different variations of all of that all come up to me. And it, and it blows my mind every single time this happens. I always go back to my home and say, I had the best day at church. I got all these people coming up with this joy flowing out of their face. People from all over the world sitting right next to you. People who have a lot of money, people who just got out of prison, people who are poor, people in middle class, people who are going to prison. Literally, I have people come to me who are very successful and the next person in line says, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm going to prison next week. I mean, it's diverse. And every single one of them is loved by God. And to see the joy of God come out of their face is so unbelievable. Amen. <laughs> And for you to miss that and come and just be here around and go home into your bubble. We have to do more than just sit together. Worship together is to really now connect with each other and acknowledge each other. And when you go to your job and you're around, or your friends and you're around all the chitter chatter about those people, that you would be the people of God and say, no, 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 no. They matter. <laughs> I'm not going to be that person. And y'all know what I'm talking about. Because we all got that chatter chatter about those people. Whoever those people are to you. Is that we're not going to be those people. We're going to be the people of God that says that God loves all people and all people matter. And he died for everybody. And whatever that racism looks like, I'm not going to be for it. I'm going to be against it. And it's going to take courage because some of your friends and your family are those people. Some of you are those people. I'm so glad you took the step to come here. But there's more steps to take, more neighborhoods to visit, more people to get to know, more barriers to get broken down in your heart. That we don't want to act like that this is all you got to do. I checked the box. I went to a church where there were some people who didn't look like me. That God said, no, 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 you got to love them. What does that mean? <laughs> love them just like you would love your own. And that's going to take a revolution in your heart, a transformation in your heart. And that's my challenge to you. One more thing. That you would nurture a sense of belonging. Um, <laughs> Second Samuel chapter 14. Solomon was banished. And some lady came up to David and challenged him to, uh, after Absalom, Absalom, to restore the king. And it says, the king, speaks this one, the king speaks this thing as one who is guilty in that the king does not bring back his son, banished ones from him. That God, God finds ways to redeem his banished ones. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2.3, it is good and pleasing in the sight of the God, the Savior, who desires all people to be saved. God says, I want you to do everything you can to make everybody you know feel part of your family. That you would love those people who don't look like you, who don't live near you, who don't make what you make, who may not talk like you. They come from a whole different side of the tracks. <laughs> I want you to represent me and I want you to go love them. And make them feel when they're at your job, in your neighborhood, when they're next to you in line at the store, that they belong. And that you don't represent a barrier to them, but a welcoming arms to them. That our church would represent that in this community. Because this, this nation has had racism part of it since the beginning. And it's gone somewhat underground and people act like it's no big deal. And these are isolated incidences and it's just not that true. 
And there are people who carry that burden with them every single day. And it's, imp- it's a, our responsibility as believers with the people in our world to say, Lord, show me how I can be a representative of love and inclusion to whoever you bring into my life and not turn a deaf ear to the people who claim they're hurting and under, underserved. There was a, a football player here in town three, week, three months ago. He doesn't live in town. He's an NFL player, and he is um, one of the most prominent NFL players in the league, period. And he was here staying at a, uh, a certain neighborhood at a country club. This was three months ago. And he went into the buffet of the country club. And someone said to him, uh, the help get the food in the back. He went into the sauna and someone said to him, the workers, they're not, they don't belong in here. <laughs> you all know who this person is. It doesn't really matter where you know who he is. He didn't work there. He could buy any five of those houses at the same time. He was just there temporarily. It exists. And some of your friends are those people. Don't be that person. Represent Jesus Christ. Often people come to church to feel good. We should come to church to be transformed. My encouragement today is that you be transformed. And that you be challenged. And that you walk out here, I, I. If you got your toes stepped on, praise the Lord. Here's my challenge to you. Here's my challenge to you. Here's my challenge to you. Um, before you leave this room and all the campuses, I would challenge all the campuses, before you leave the room where you are, you are surrounded by people who don't look like you. Don't be nervous about what I'm getting ready to ask you to do. Matter of fact, just take a look around the room, look around the people around you who don't look like you. Say, praise the Lord. Lord. It's God's art. God is an artist. And those people who don't look like you, they are marvelous. They're marvelous. Before you leave the room where you are, I want you to go up to one of them that you don't know. Some of you are very uncomfortable right now. (laughs) And if you are uncomfortable right now, I pray that you can move out of that area of your life because that is not a good place to be. And I want you to go up to someone you don't know. And this this is, I'm, I'm applying this to all of us. And say, what is your name? How can I pray for you? You don't need to pray for them right there on the spot. So if you're uncomfortable praying in public, it's not about that. It's just looking them in the eye. The eye is a lamp to your soul. Say, how can I pray for you? That's step one. And when you go to work tomorrow and you go to school tomorrow and you have that thought in your mind about that person that looks different than you, if that thought is not a God-honoring thought, rebuke it. And say, Lord, if I'm going to be your son, your daughter, I cannot, unless I can call that person my brother and sister in Christ, Unless they could be my brother and sister, I cannot pray our father. You cannot. You cannot hate your brother who you see and say you love God who you can't see. And so today is just a little, little step. It's going up to somebody and you say, oh, I know a bunch of black people. I know a bunch of white people. I know a bunch of Latino. That's fine. Just do it anyway. Because the person you may be talking to may not. And if you see someone walk into their car, go grab them. Hey, hey, hey. And if someone comes running after you, (laughs) don't run. Don't run. (laughs) Just stop. (laughs) Here's what's sad is that you're missing out on a bunch of great people. There's a bunch of wonderful people sitting right near you whose life experience is diametrically opposed to yours. And they're wonderful people. And the devil is trying to keep you away from them. Amen.
what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pray for our offering our services over. And I'm going to end the service right here differently than, than normal. Usually the campus pastors come up in, at the end. I'm going, to ask the, I'm going to ask the pastoral support team to come. This is not a time to leave. We're just going to pray here for a minute. But I'm going to ask the pastoral support team and all the campuses to come to the front of the stage. And I'm going to pray for our offering. Matter of fact, let's give, the, 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 let's give a, a hand for our offering right now. Amen. Um, we take our offering at all of our exits. There are boxes where you, we take our offering as we leave in all our campuses. There are boxes at the exits of all our campuses, and we give our offering in those boxes. You have an envelope there in your bulletin that you can put your offering in. Or you can give online. All the people online have that box right there on your screen. You can, you can give online. You actually can set up where it comes automatically online as well. Or you can text to give. You text uh, to that number on the screen any offering you want. But we appreciate all that you give every week, which is the only way we can pay our bills. We thank you for that. And so I want to thank you in advance for what you give. Uh, for all the fathers, we have donuts out there for you. Um, but as I pray for offering, I want to challenge you to not leave the room, not leave the campus before you say something to somebody. And ask God to clean this out here. And ask God to check your heart. Ask God this week, have you listened to your conversation, listened to your thoughts, listened to the conversations of the people that you hang with. And have him open up to your eyes to the biases you have. And say, Lord, that has no place in the kingdom of God. No matter what someone has done to you, it has no place in the kingdom of God. For all of us. So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. Lord, I pray for the offering. I pray in all our campuses that you will prepare people to give. I thank you for the people who are generous, self-sacrificial. I thank you for the people who are tithing, returning back to you what is already yours, the tithe. And I thank you for the people who give over and above the tithe. And, Lord, I pray for that person, that three, four, or five people who right now you're speaking to to give way more than they ever thought they would ever give. And you've been speaking to them over and over, and they keep thinking they're not hearing God because it's too much. I pray that they would know it's God. And they will be faithful and obedient in their giving. And, Lord, I pray for our church. The, the secrets, the secret barriers of racism that are in our hearts that we never talk about except with our close friends. The whispers behind closed doors. I pray you cleanse that from our heart. That you cleanse that from our church. And that we represent a light in our families, in our communities, with our friends. And that we don't let the status quo be the status quo. And that we confront it in our hearts. We confront it with our people. And we take responsibility for what we can be responsible for, our own lives. It is not from God. And, Lord, I pray as people talk after service that you would do supernatural work in their heart and that we would make more room for the Holy Spirit to move in our life and that you would remove all bitterness and envy and hatred and anger and fear and ignorance and arrogance from our heart. And fill it with love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. There's no law against all those things. Though there may be laws that discriminate, you cannot, there's no law that can discriminate against the love in my heart. And so, Lord, let it flow. Let it flow. Lord, bless us. Bless our offering that we give financially. Bless the offering we give of our life and our love to one another. In Jesus' name. We pray, amen. And all of our services, God bless you. Let's give the Lord a hand, amen. God bless you, God bless you.